<laughs> okay. Is any look like her name? There we go. Okay, that shows us that she has a sign left. Okay. <laughs> Good morning and welcome to the Mid Atlantic Nostalgia Convention. I'm Bill Ellison. This morning we're going to. Hey! And this morning we're going to talk about the uh, career of broadcast journalist Edward R. Murrow. Primarily because I'm a radio guy, we're going to kind of look at a lot more of the radio side and maybe in the future we'll lose more television thing. But we'll cover his entire career. He was born Edward, Egbert, I can't even say that, Roscoe Murrow in uh, Greensboro, North Carolina. And uh, went to Washington State College, Pullman, Washington, in 1926, majoring in, of all things, speech. And uh, then got involved in uh, college politics. And one thing led to another. And in 1935, Ed Murrow was hired by CBS as the director of talks. And of course, not particularly as a broadcaster, as an on-air person. At the time, the only uh, newscaster at CBS was a gentleman named Robert Trout. And then, and basically, news up until this point was simply someone reading wire copy or reheating newspaper copy because radio was a very new thing to this news. In fact, um, okay, must be someone somewhere. Anyways, with that amusing music of compliment, <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll mention that um, lost track. We'll be there. Okay. Thank God we're not live. Here we go. I don't know where it is. Oh, here it is. Anyway, what I was going to say was that uh, Robert Trout would end many of his newscasts with uh, and for more details, read your local newspaper, because simply the infrastructure wasn't there for networks to do that. And we'll find out what, how Murrow was uh, very much involved in putting that together and really inventing broadcast journalism as we know it. Well, as a reaction to some of the news breaking out in the, about the 1938-39 period over in Europe, uh, CBS had an idea to begin to cover events of world importance. And on March 13th of 1938, Robert Trout was the anchor of a broadcast which was really the first multi-point pickup of any network radio newscast. And that's kind of revolutionary. We think of it today because there's satellite drops everywhere. But this was all done by shortwave and it was hastily put together. And this was to be really the forerunner for what would be world news tonight. Well, because of this, Ed Murrow actually had to go on the air because he uh, had gone to Austria. This was during the Austrians. And he fired his, filed, not fired, but filed his first report for CBS. Is speaking from Vienna. It's now nearly 2 30 in the morning, and their Hitler has not yet arrived. No one seems to know just when he will get here, but most people expect him sometime after 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. It's of course obvious at the one glance at Vienna that a tremendous reception is being prepared, and we're planning to bring you an eyewitness account of Herr Hitler's entry into Vienna sometime tomorrow. We return you now to America. So as you can see, it wasn't too much of a beginning, but that's how the public began to know that. Well, as war broke out in 1939, Murrow found himself in London during the Blitz. And as we mentioned, um, the, the style of journalism would begin to change. And that was a very descriptive style of reporting that really could be done for the first time of how things related to him. And this was kind of ironic because he's talking about a really terrific use for cigarettes. And this was, he's talking about the London blackout. London, as usual, is black tonight. One gets accustomed to it. But it can hardly be called pleasant. I don't know how you feel about people who smoke cigarettes. But I like them. Particularly at night in London. That small, dull red glow is a very welcome sight. It prevents collision and makes it unnecessary to Heave to until you locate the exact position of those vague voices in the dark. One night several years ago, I walked bang into a cow, and since then I've had a desire for man and beast to carry running lights on dark nights. They can't do that in London these nights, but cigarettes are a good substitute. For a moment, tonight I thought I was back in the London of Mr. Pickwick's time. I heard a voice 
booming through these dark London streets. It said, 28 Portland plates, all's well. It was an air raid warden. He'd shouted them an order to cover their window. They had done so. And so he was telling them that no more light came through. As we mentioned, that it was a new style, and it, as you can tell, very descriptive, and something had never been done before. He kind of did a little bit further, because now he's going to take his mic onto a location. This is an evening of August 24th, 1940, where during an air raid at Trafalgar Square, Merrill took the CBS microphone along and reported as the uh, particular uh, air raid was going off. And yes, sir. Just real quick, as a side note, as I remember, I think he actually held the microphone down low so you could hear the people walking. He so talks about that. That's another thing. His descriptive language. Now, I, I work at NPR, and, we, and the writers there, I watch them every day, um, taking a, a lot of time to make sure there's this very descriptive language. And, and this guy was had living this kind of stuff. And you mentioned that with the with the sound of the feet, and he says that it sounds like the, the uh, what was it, ghosts shot in steel shoes. And yeah. he would use these, this kind of imagery. And you'll hear more of this later on. We're going to play with Marcus Straight in Hell, and we'll hear some more of this stuff. But this guy is off the top of his head like that. That's why he is so great. So let's go back. This is August 24th of 40, with Merle during the, uh, the air raid in Trafalgar Square. This is Trafalgar Square. The noise that you hear at the moment is the sound of the air raid siren. I'm standing here just on the steps of St. Martin's in the Fields. A searchlight just burst into action off in the distance, one single beam sweeping the sky above me now. People are walking along quite quietly. We're just at the entrance of an air raid shelter here, and I must move this cable over just a bit so people can walk in. I can see just straight away in front of me Lord Nelson on top of that big column. There's another searchlight just square behind Nelson's statue. I'll just let you listen to the traffic and the sound of the siren for a moment. Just a few people here walking rather hurriedly toward the air raid shelters. Some of them casually, a man stops in front of me to light a cigarette. Here comes one of those big red buses around the corner. Double deckers they are, just a few lights on the top deck. In this blackness, it looks very much like a ship that's passing in the night, and you just see the porthole. There goes another bus, more searchlights coming to action. You see them reach straight up into the sky, and occasionally they catch a cloud and seem to splash on the bottom of it. The little traffic lights here, just a small cross on the normal globe, are now red. The cars pull up and stop. I'll just ooze down in the darkness here along these steps and see if I can pick up the sound of people's feet as they walk along. One of the strangest sounds one can hear in one of these days, or rather these dark nights, just the sound of footsteps walking along the street, like ghosts shod with steel shoes. The taxi draws up just in front and stops, just waiting for that red light to change to green while the siren calls. There it goes, and the cars move off. More searchlights are in action. We've not yet seen any burst of any aircraft fire overhead. An air raid warden walks out of this shelter. The shelter here, you know, is the crypt underneath this famous old church just on the edge of Trafalgar Square. The crypt where in days of peace, homeless men and women were able to find a nice lodging. So, I, and I, I know that it's amazing to me, and of course I'm a little biased because I just love his reporting, but I don't think you hear anything like that today. And it's just an amazing. Um, and, and we're going to demonstrate that a little bit further. One of the things that became famous for Merrill, and he did this quite often, 